Here at Camus, so we're a freestanding ambulatory surgery center. And we're a full service, multi-specialty, 6,000 plus surgeries a year. Uh, we are partners with the virtual health system. The mission here is to be the center of choice for the surrounding communities, attract high quality physicians, nursing staff, and the patients that need to be served. When the center was developed, the whole premise was to provide high quality outpatient surgical care. And in doing that, we had to keep our equipment here up to date, as well as cutting edge. We selected Fujifilm to be our laparoscopic equipment here for a reason. And the reason is, is because it does help provide quality of care to our patients, and we're not wasting our money by getting an inferior product that is not going to last the test of time. Fujifilm is clearly the most superior that we tested. We also found the service aspect of it and the reliability to be outstanding and economically feasible for the surgery center. With the new Fujifilm technology that we acquired a couple of years ago, I've done hundreds of procedures here which have uh, benefited our patients at the center. The visualization is excellent, um, and I think through better visualization, less having to fuss to achieve an excellent picture, I think you do save time overall in the procedures in an outpatient setting like this. That's particularly important. My specialty is minimally invasive hand surgery. I'm always trying to find the simplest, best solution for my patients' problems. Fujifilm has definitely made it easier to do my job in the operating room. I love the Fujifilm towers and the Bluetooth second tower has made a big difference. It's easy for my assistant to see over my shoulder while I'm looking at the main screen. We don't have wires flying all over the place. Clarity of the screens and my ability to adjust exactly what I need to see in terms of zooming and focusing has made it just so much easier to do the minimally invasive procedures that I do. When we evaluated the different systems, what stood out about Fujifilm was our rep. Not only did he come in and um, discuss it first with management and then introduce it to the surgeons and the staff, but was there for us every step of the way. No matter what hours, no matter what days of the week we need them, they were always there. You're looking at the relationship between industry and clinical medicine, and how can it be a symbiotic relationship? And I think part of it is having a company that can listen to what the clinician or surgeon is actually saying, seeing the difficulties we are having, and modifying or coming back with ideas and new technology that help address those concerns. I am looking forward to and expecting that Fujifilm will continue to help uh, develop the laparoscopic platforms to meet modern demands including 4K technology, um, immunofluorescence, ability to detect tumors, um, bile, blood flow, things of that nature through sophisticated technologies. We're very excited about continuing our relationship with Fujifilm. Their customer service has been impeccable and we know that they will continue to lead the industry in technology and we hope to be at the forefront of that with them. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so welcome to this uh, session uh, in ELSA on advances, innovation, and uh, telehealth. So uh, I am uh, Professor Philip Chiu from uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. So co-chairing this session with me is uh, Professor Nakajima from Osaka University, Japan, and also uh, Professor Balian from uh, Indonesia in the Ketling uh, hospital. So uh, we are very excited to have uh, this session because uh, we have uh, four renowned uh, speaker who are pre presenting on the innovation and telehealth and a lot of advances in the surgical uh, side uh, from, for the minimal invasive surgery. So without further ado, let me first introduce our first speaker who is uh, Professor Amir Sot. Uh, he is uh, from the Asia Medical Group in Israel. So, uh, Professor Sot is a pioneer laparoscopic surgeon and trained in surgery in the Hadassah Medical Center in Jerusalem and also Mount Sinai <coughs> Medical Center in New York. So he, in the late 90s, he was the founder and first president of the uh, Israeli Society of Endoscopic uh, Surgery and a board member and also technology uh, committee and the chairman of the uh, European Association of Endoscopic Surgeons and uh, also a member of the Technology Committee of Sages. 
and a board member of Israeli Society of Surgeons. So he is uh, currently serving on the steering committee of ISMIT, and he's the founder, <laughs> advisor, and also board member for many medical device startup company in Israel and Europe, and covering a lot of aspects for uh, minimal invasive surgery, uh, and including 3D vision uh, and uh, robotics, uh, and also uh, glue and laser technology. So I think uh, to me, uh, Amir is uh, not only a good friend, but also one of the most innovative surgeons that I've ever met. So without further ado, please, uh, Professor Amir Sot, to start your lecture. Thank you, Philip. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, I will start my presentation uh, now. I hope it works. No. Excuse me one second. Can you see? Not yet, not yet. Hold on a second, sorry. I don't see it, wait. I'm sorry, I, I have it on my screen. I shared it a moment ago and now I don't see it. But I... Can you see my screen now? Not, not yet, sir. Hold no. on a second. Not yet. Yeah. Sorry. For some reason, it's not running. Just a moment, please. I'm sorry. It was running a second ago. I don't understand. Let me try again, I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. Yes. Sorry, sorry for- uh, No problem, no problem, no problem. Okay, so I'm going to speak a little about uh, uh, robots, but not uh, what you are used to seeing, but uh, something small and agile. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. <clears throat> so when you think about a robot, you actually think of something that's uh, sophisticated and has a lot of uh, uh, autonomous uh, capabilities, not of uh, uh, something that can react, interact with the, uh, with the environment and can perform on its own. This is a fantastic uh, example of a robot made by Boston Dynamics Company. <clears throat> And you see the robot was instructed to open the door and it will open the door even if you interrupt. However, most of what we have today, well, robots are actually information machines, which are <clears throat> uh, devices that take uh, computerized information and make it uh, into some, and make it into the reality. What we have today are not uh, robots. Uh, they are more uh, electromechanical systems because they translate exactly what the surgeon does uh, to the operative field, it has uh, zero autonomous uh, interaction. And uh, what it allows us is to do surgery uh, via a specific uh, 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 machine. And I think that in a way, uh, driving a Da Vinci robot is a little like driving a Bugatti Varian. Uh, it's, uh, it's about the same price, about uh, $2 million. And it drives you from one place to another in a fantastic way. Uh, it's very comfortable, uh, but it still needs a driver and it does exactly what the driver asks it. Sometimes it will prevent an accident, <coughs> excuse me, but still uh, the system is completely dependent on the driver. If the driver is stupid, uh, there will be accidents. So I was thinking, uh, we were thinking that maybe not everybody needs something like that, but a lot of uh, surgeons uh, might uh, like something like this. Uh, it's still a car, it can drive you from one place to another and can do a lot of stuff, uh, but at a much uh, more affordable uh, way. 
And if you look at the, the progress of robotics, you see that uh, we are really far away from the dream. Everybody was telling us about autonomous surgery uh, and autonomous uh, interventions. And we are exactly more or less at the same as the cars are. Uh, everybody was selling us uh, self-driving cars, but I'm sure none of you have seen many completely autonomous self-driving cars on the street. You see cars that do a lot of cool stuff, but uh, very few of them are really aut completely autonomous. And there's actually a huge gap between, uh, between uh, the large robotic systems and the really terrible laparoscopic instruments that we all use today. Uh, these are instruments. These are instruments that were. These are instruments that were uh, uh, invented about 45 years ago, even before laparoscopy, mostly for ENT procedures, and then uh, made a little longer. And this gap needs to be filled by a lot of uh, things. <clears throat> what do we get from using a robotic system? We get dexterity. We get precision. We get stability. We get uh, excellent uh, 3D vision, and we get very good ergonomics. Uh, and you think of it, most of what we get from current robotic systems is things that we don't really need. You know, we all speak about precision, but uh, micro and precision in general surgery <coughs> is actually not necessary. You know, we all know that in abdominal surgery, uh, we can err on uh, millimeters or even centimeters sometimes, and nothing bad will happen. And uh, actually, it would be may, made much more sense to use uh, very precise robotic systems for microsurgery, for brain surgery, but not for abdominal uh, surgery. And 3D vision, you can buy today off the shelf fantastic uh, systems, 4K or 3D that shows you uh, amazing images. Uh, you don't need a robotic system to see in 3D or in 4K. Uh, so the idea was is to develop robotic uh, uh, systems that are within the sterile field that allow a hybrid and incorporation of multiple tools in the operating field. They don't need a dedicated uh, team and they're much more uh, flexible to be used uh, on a daily basis in many hospitals uh, and operating rooms. There are several uh, mechanical solutions to that. This is a Korean company making a mechanical articulated uh, system. Uh, there's another company from the US, uh, Flexdex, that does that. Uh, this is a handheld articulating system. Uh, we find uh, that once it is mechanical, it's uh, very, very limited, first of all, in forces. And secondly, uh, if it's not a computerized platform, uh, it prevents you from doing things that are uh, more sophisticated, like scaling motion, uh, recording motion, and using data from the operation for other I think there are several electromechanical uh, devices on the market uh, that are uh, like that, also like that, but uh, they are uh, less intuitive, they're quite bulky, and all of them are uh, needle holders. Most of them are needle holders, uh, and they do not allow you to perform a complex motion. Uh, more uh, just articulation and, and rotation in a sequential order. So you can't really use your, your wrist the way you would use it in the real world. Uh, this one is, uh, works with five millimeter trocus. It's a French company, a very beautiful uh, device as well. We uh, thought that uh, it would be a good idea to, to make something the more a complex that really mimics the motion of uh, the surgeon's hand. Uh, and we wanted something that has better ergonomy, very good dexterity, and especially a very short uh, learning curve. And we have developed uh, this. This is a, a system that uh, you hold in your hand, but it's, com it's really a, a robotized uh, laparoscopic instrument. Whatever you do with your fingers happens at the tip, and whatever you do with your wrist happens at the tip as well. So it's really a very uh, intuitive, or maybe instinctive, because intuitive is already taken, a device that allows you all the dexterity and the uh, 
maneuverability of the human hand even a little more because you can augment the motion in different directions. And uh, in a way, you're holding a, a robotic arm uh, in your hand, uh, completely uh, allowing you complete freedom of motion inside the, the abdomen. Uh, this company started about eight years ago in Israel, and uh, it's now a device that is uh, FDA and CE approved. And you can rigidi rigidize it, you can double click the, and then it becomes a rigid instrument at an angle. You can limit the motion uh, to create a less a jumpy instrument and allow surgeons uh, learning curve with long uh, short learning curve so uh, and you can really perform really nicely in difficult angles uh, suturing and uh, and uh, not tying uh, very beautifully uh, currently there is a needle holder so and the tips of the instrument are uh, replaceable so you can use a needle holder uh, scissors grasper, hook, whatever is common. You can see you can suture towards you and away from you, and it's really nice. It has a very sophisticated control interface, a, a very a smart uh, a computerized system within it that's very small but very, very big in terms of the data acquisition and control. It has a very good articulation solution. It could be personalized both to the surgeon and the procedure. These are the three components, the control interface, the drive unit, and a detachable instrument. Uh, this is a fly-by-wire. There's no mechanical connection between the control interface and the drive unit. It's all signals, so it could be detached and used for uh, remote surgery as well. It's uh, fully wristed. It's customizable and lightweight. And uh, as compared to other big systems, you're not committed to a number of instruments or you don't need a dedicated staff you can take the device out of uh, one trocar and put it in another trocar you can use it for a part of the procedure and move it away when it's in your way or you don't need it and it takes a few hours to learn how to use it there's no bigger joy for uh, somebody who thinks of an idea and then it becomes a product and you can actually use it on your own patients uh, this is abdominal wall uh, reconstructions uh, performed by me using uh, this device in uh, my hospital. Uh, it allows for very precise and very uh, nice suturing uh, in angles that are difficult to perform uh, in regular uh, laparoscopic surgery. And uh, it can be used, uh, it is used now in, it has been used uh, in Europe, it is available, uh, it is sold by Esculap in Europe has been used in, uh, in quite a few places in the, in, in, and also in the East Coast, uh, in the United States and in Portland, Oregon. We've performed about 300 cases using the device worldwide, uh, including almost everything that's in general surgery, uh, also urology, uh, thoracic surgery and pediatric surgery, and the system worked uh, very nicely. Uh, this is a compilation of uh, procedures that uh, were performed using the system. You can see a hernia repair, a colectomy, upper GI procedure, uh, and a radical uh, prostatectomy. You can see it's been used for the anastomosis of the urethra to the uh, bladder neck. Uh, for a laparoscopic uh, tap procedure, it can replace using a tack tacking device, uh, both for suturing and anchoring the mesh and uh, for uh, closing the peritoneum, which makes it even more cost effective than the tacker. The detachable instrument is cheaper than a tacking uh, device on the market. Uh, we've done a usability trial, uh, asking surgeons to, to rate the, use, the usability of the instrument, and uh, it got very good uh, numbers. One is the best uh, mark, so surgeon thought it would uh, make them easier, make many procedures easier, increase the comfort. Uh, and something that I find it very important is that surgeons said that they had fun using it because I think 
the fun factor is a very important thing. We should not suffer in the operating room. We should enjoy working and enjoy operating. And if there's a technology that can make it nicer for us to and, and makes us enjoy surgery, I think it's very important that it's uh, developed. There are more instruments that are coming soon, uh, monopolar advanced uh, procedures, and it's fully commercial uh, in Europe uh, and little in the United States. This is uh, my vision of uh, what I want to do. I think uh, we should combine something that is bedside that you can also uh, control from your body, sometimes remotely and sometimes uh, using a handheld device and a combination of all that are all orchestrated by a single surgeon. Uh, this is a fault of a vision, not a, not a, not a, it's an animation. Uh, these are not, no, most of it is not products that are on the market, but you can think of uh, holding an instrument in your hand, but also controlling other instruments in the, in the, in the surgical fields. It could be controlled by the same uh, human interface. And I think it's very important for the human interfaces of many devices to be similar. For the same reason, you're not uh, learning, getting a new license for every car uh, that you get. I think that uh, we should be using uh, very similar uh, interfaces to drive everything that we use, including flex flexible endoscopes, uh, articulated instruments, catheters, and uh, robotic uh, systems. So uh, with that, I will conclude. Uh, robots are here to stay. There are going to be many types of them. They should be cost effective. They should not be only uh, for uh, rich hospitals and rich uh, societies, but they should go into smaller hospitals uh, and to, into countries and societies that are less resourceful, but still need to operate patients uh, in a smart way. And I'm sending you my greetings from uh, my hometown, Tel Aviv. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Sok. And um, so I think uh, maybe we can uh, entertain uh, one or two questions before we move on, uh, if you have any. Uh, so may I ask, um, so I think the concept of a robot is a little bit different as compared to what we have for, because uh, the uh, robotic surgery is being implanted with a concept that uh, we should be remotely uh, controlling, teleport controlling a robot system. But what you are telling us is that we can actually control the robot system from our own hand directly in contact with the patient, not sitting away from the, the patient. So. Uh, in that uh, perspective, um, so what do you see about the advantage and also the disadvantage of uh, having this handheld robot? So the, certainly, you know, that the current uh, robotic systems were uh, invented because by, it was a project by NASA and DARPA, the American Army, to look for solutions to uh, operate patients in, you know, irradiated areas or on Mars. And uh, currently, we're not really using, except for the ergonomic part, we're not really using the remote control. Okay, the surgeon is sitting three feet away from the patient. So we're not really using the remote control, except for the fact that the surgeon can sit down. And the system is very, very stable because it is a big, massive system that stands on the floor. So stability is an important thing. And the fact that you're running a console that has all the features of the operating room from the same spot makes some uh, makes some sense, but in terms of cost, and not only cost, even uh, logistic burden, you know, you need a room, you need a staff, you need, you need docking and undocking. Uh, uh, you cannot, there's a large turnover time between uh, patients. So I think uh, the idea of making something that is a robotic extension of your body makes a lot of sense. I don't think it replaces large robotic systems, but I think it's a very very strong complementary uh, thing to help work side by side or independently. The disadvantage is that it, it's a little harder uh, to control because there's a lot of motion. It's not, so, it's not as stable as a large system and it takes some learning and surgeons expect it to, to behave like a laparoscopic instrument but it doesn't, and they, you need to learn how to use your wrist again, which is uh, something funny. But 
uh, after a while you can get very good at that and it's very very nice to work with it and uh, thank you so uh, one of uh, the question coming uh, is that uh, the uh, question that asked from the our audience is uh, I have tried some of these devices and found it very difficult to man maneuver it without a 3d camera system is there any instrument that can be easily used without a 3d camera so first of all it's interesting uh, it is very very variable between people the need for 3d system some people uh, find it very important because articulation is not connected to our nervous system and you need a better visual clue some surgeons need 3d and some surgeons don't uh, you can make the instrument uh, uh, you can lock the instrument at a certain angle and then it makes it easier to work if you will need 3D. But there are features in this device that could be used if you need 3D. You don't really need it. it for some people, it's nice to have. Thank you. And I think we will start uh, the next uh, lecture. So may I introduce, ask uh, Professor Nakajima to introduce. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip. Um, this is Dr. Nakajima from Osaka, Japan. Uh, it is my uh, great honor and pleasure to uh, serve as one of the uh, moderators here, here in um, ELSA uh, Congress. Um, I want to introduce next speaker, um, Professor Sugimoto. Uh, he is from uh, Tokyo University. Um, Professor Sugimoto is, uh, is basically, he's a surgeon and still surgeon, right? I believe. <laughs> and then he's also a kind of a pioneering uh, researcher in the field of virtual uh, reality um, and um, augmented reality in society. And also he is well known as one of the uh, um, entrepreneurs, uh, company builder, uh, which is very unique uh, as a surgeon, and at, at least in, in our country. Uh, um, he's a graduate of Tokyo University and has now as a, served as a faculty in the same university. He holds a lot of uh, patents regarding uh, the uh, medical and uh, engineering sectors. And, um, and one of the, his uh, strikingly um, interesting work is, uh, is uh, he is a, a kind of an offshore ambassador of uh, software called uh, Osalix which is the most widely used medical image diagram viewer uh, in, the, in, in, in this field. So, um, um, Professor Sugimoto, can you start your lecture? Thank you very much for a kind introduction for me, uh, Dr. Nakajima and uh, as a uh, Congress chairman. And uh, today would, I would like to talk about the extended reality in surgery and telemedicine. So this movie was captured in our actual operative room. This is not the, uh, 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 the image guide. And uh, minimal, as, as you know, minimal invasive surgery requires a high degrees of spatial awareness or the orientation that, like that. A surgeon's spatial awareness is diminished because of complex procedures, limited environments, such as uh, devices, endoscopic view is very narrow, and the working space is quite small. And high eye coordination is a little bit difficult for the young surgeons. So we used to use the image guided surgery using the 2D monitor. It's good. It's just like a car navigation. It's good, but it's only the 2D monitor. We are now using the spatial guided surgery using a 3D space. It's better than the 2D monitor because the patient's body is 3D, right? This is the differences. If you watch the 3D monitor, you can see all the direction from that same direction. If you put the patient data in a 3D space, you can see all directions you want because you can move around the move, the, the anatomy it is. This 
technology is called extended reality. XR is the umbrella term that converts VR, AR, MR, and other immersive technologies. So VR means the immersing yourself in a completely artificial world. AR means overlying a digital layer of complex uh, contextual information into a built environment. The mixed reality is an interactive mix of VR and AR. So XR is a term referring to all real and virtual combined environment and human machine interactions generated by spatial computer technology and wearables. Okay, the key is the wearables. You can buy it with a low cost. So VR is immersing yourself completely in on the an artificial world. You cannot see the actual world by your own eyes because the three elements for VR is needed, presence, interaction, and autonomy. But if you use the see-through mixed reality glasses, you can see the real world during the surgery and you can use your hands like uh, interface for manipulating the 3D data in the air using the gesture controls manipulation. This device has three elements. One is the spatial 3D camera and the RGB cameras and the depth sensor. It can capture all the environment of your, uh, your uh, situation in the operative room or it can calculate the movement of your hand like a, a mouse or a controllers. Not only you, but also other people such as the nurses, patient, patient family, they can share these 3D holograms in the air using these kind of mixed reality glasses. And we can share these data between several surgeons during the surgery. When the anesthetist put the needle into a vertebra, they can see whole direction they want to put the correct area of a, a small space between the vertebra and the vertebra. It is very uh, useful for uh, guiding the open surgery like uh, uh, esophagus cancer and a pancreatic cancer, but for a laparoscopic surgery, you cannot see the anatomy by your own eye, naked eye. But if you put the pots, you can select the correct area of an abdominal wall to put this holographic data onto a patient body. Using the RGB camera and the spatial uh, sensors, you can calculate the correct location of the patient and the holograms. So you can match it on the actual environment. As you see, the surgeon is wearing the sterile gloves because they can put this data using their gesture even during the surgery. So laparoscopic cholecystectomy, you can see the patient individual anatomy like uh, hepatic artery, cystic artery, and the cystic duct around the uh, CBD. For a pancreatic cancer surgery, you can see all anatomy, like uh, artery, vessels, biliary duct, pancreatic duct, and the uh, uh, parenchyma of the pancreas in the air. This patient have a, a IHPD cancer, and during surgery, we, can put, we could put the needle into a cystic duct and they put the uh, contrast material during the surgery. We can calculate the CD a uh, CAT scan during the surgery. And we can reconstruct this data within 10 minutes. After 10 minutes reconstructing the biliary duct 3D structure, we can see it in the patient body, on, onto the patient body during the surgery. We can select the margin of the liver. This patient had a liver cancer, and we should put the needle into a, a portrait vein 
to staying with ICG using the fluorescent navigation, but it is very difficult to put the needle into a portal vein because this surgery is a laparoscopic hepatectomy. You can see the tips of the uh, ultrasonic uh, probe in the abdomen, but you can see the guideline through the abdominal wall to the tip of the endoscope of the ultrasound. So only you can do, uh, uh, all you have to do is put the needle along the green guideline like this. So we completely put the needle into a portal vein. The fluorescent navigation can be down, could be down. So this is how to do it. After generating the polygon file of the each organs using the CAT scan or MRI, you can upload these polygon data to a commercially available website. And after 10 minutes, you can download the asset file of the uh, mixed reality application and then download it to your own VR Google, like uh, HCC5, HCC Reverb, Oculus Quest, Orange 2, or Magic Leap. You can buy it from Amazon. Not so uh, expensive. So using this situation, it is very useful for to uh, telemedicine and telesurgery. We can share this 3D location and position of the, uh, and uh, the patient anatomy in the VR environment like this. Every surgeon can wear the VR glasses, but they can set along the patient data the same, at the same time. And you can see the hand movement and the gaze line to the virtual environment. And we can uh, screen sharing, screen share of this VR environment using the different monitors like uh, light eye and left eye. This is the side by side monitor. And if you watch this screen sharing using the smartphone, you can buy on the Wanderer via Google from a, a Google or a Cardboard. And you, you can use it to watch the VR using your smartphone. Only put your smartphone into a Wanderer Google, you can see it. And now in Japan, many uh, several universities are already installed these applications for uh, lectures and education and training for uh, medical students, medical young uh, doctors. And this is the topics of the uh, Lear avatar. You can upload your face photo to this website. You can create a 3D avatar like that, and we can share the 3D polygons in the virtual environment from the distant part. This movie was captured actually from the New York and Tokyo. There's no time differences. And then you can see the PDF file behind me. And it, it is available for a presentation or uh, such lectures using the VR goggles. Using the mixed reality goggle, you are there using the mixed reality like that. This patient data is actually the coronavirus infection. This movie was captured from uh, Dubai and Tokyo. And this is my operative room in Tokyo. But the, my friend, my, my friend surgeon, Dr. Ahmed, in our operative room in Tokyo at the same time. And then this uh, operative me movie was shared from uh, Dubai uh, at the real time. We can share the laparoscopic sleep, sleep gastrectomy conferences, conference from Dubai to Tokyo. And we can have a conferences for this patient, uh, where to cut, where to ligate, and uh, the side of the stomach. So you can see now the uses of this technology in the space station, you can see that the uh, International Space Station, so he is now applying to uh, trying to apply to a uh, space surgery, a real space surgery in the ISS. So 
uh, using the point cloud, point based cloud services, we can share the point cloud human in the air using the uh, very cheap 3D scanner. I think this is very useful for our teleconference and uh, telemedicine uh, against the COVID-19. So conclusion, extraterrestrial surgery improves your spatial recognition and overcomes limitations of surgeons' spatial awareness in minimum invasive surgery. So I think XR gives you a new normal of surgery and telemedicine. Thank you for attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Sugimoto. Um, I want to make one point clear, your statement. And statement. You want to say that we are in a kind of a transitional phase from 2D guidance to 3D guidance. Is that OK? Right. And um, you showed some system, a practical system in your lecture, yep. uh, working very practically in the, in, in the operating room. But uh, is that a still the prototype or the final phase of your um, device system? Yeah, this, this system, uh, all, all of these systems are already commercially available. And we already installed this system more than 100 institutions in Japan. Wow. Yeah, now you can use it. So it's totally commercially available. Is right. that your system? Does your system require any kind of uh, approval from the uh, medical device authority, like uh, PMDA or? FDA. Yes, uh, we already got the uh, Japanese medical device licenses from uh, PMDA in Japan, and now we are applying to FDA and CE. So that's the kind of uh, part of the medical device, right? It's right, a software. Right, right. Plus so you require device. require the regulation, uh, regulatory right. process. All right. Uh, but now, uh, as you, as you know, you know the Apple Watch was approved from uh, uh, PMDA in Japan for mm -hmm. medical devices, and also available for uh, uh, FD approval medical device, the upper was right? right. So now we are applying these kind of uh, mixerity goggles like uh, HoloLens or uh, Magic Leap uh, to uh, Japanese uh, PMDA mm -hmm. to approve the, the medical device as a hardware. But it's a little bit difficult because we can calculate some uh, influence to other medical devices, right? Yes. So now we are approaching to an uh, MPM. Yeah, but it's not only in Japan, but also the other you know, right. Our system, like a regulatory system, is not compatible with the current progress of the virtual uh, engineering or virtual reality world. So that we right. need to revise our, you know, our system to, to accommodate or to fit the regulation to uh, the new technology like yours. Right, 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 right. Any, other, any other questions from the uh, audience or the chairman? Professor Barria? Uh, how long is the learning curve for this? I'm sorry, I'm sorry? Learning curve. How long you must take time to learn it? Learning curve? Learning curve, yes. Is okay, there some we, learning curve? I'm sorry, we, we didn't calculate that, but uh, maybe it's good, I think. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, you yeah, mean, I have, have. Yes, please. Yeah, I have uh, one question. Uh, I think uh, this is an amazing uh, technology. So it seems that uh, it can shorten our um, communication distance and also maybe good, very good for training because uh, even right. if uh, you are remote in another area in the world, uh, your new technology can be uh, taught like a real person in another country. Right. So I think that is a really, really nice technology. So. Uh, my question is, um, so you also demonstrate the 3D uh, uh, localization and uh, would you envision, so because this is a uh, tally, uh, you know, uh, tally health uh, session and innovation, do you envisage that uh, you can use a robotic guide, use the 3D combined with the 3D so that uh, you can have a uh, automated robotic intervention by this 3D visualization? Yeah, yeah, I think it's very useful for surgery guided uh, automatic intervention or automatic surgery. But you know, the the, the most important thing is the uh, the regulation and the uh, responsibility, right? The doctor should have a responsibility too. So, who put the button to start? 
to the point. So uh, we, uh, this, these systems can offer these data, the calculated data or uh, the guideline to the surgeon, but they, this, this system has no automatic uh, uh, procedure system. So that's the point I think, that the responsibility is very important, I think. And, and uh, so just a follow-up question. So uh, uh, your 3D uh, actually combined the pre-operative CT. So right. uh, during the intra-op, if there's any position change, would you be yeah. able to uh, real-time uh, combine and uh, correct the, uh, the uh, little bit of error? Sure. Uh, and we, uh, we usually use the pre-operative data, but uh, nowadays in Japan, there is a hybrid, hybrid or system we can calculate during the surgery uh, using the CAT scan or OAM or something, we can merge it. But uh, imagine, imagine, please, please, please imagine that the car navigation, GPS, hub bug map, that is already captured from a satellite, right? It's not a real time captured map, right? But it's very useful because we uh, we have learned much about the anatomy using the stable data, right? So I think it's, it's very useful to uh, imagine how to cut, how to like for the individual patient using the individual patient data. Okay, uh, Professor Sugimoto, one question from the audience. Sure. Um, any, do, do you have any medical legal issues when the, uh, the data can be transmitted among the uh, different institutions or even the different countries? That's a good question because the polygon data have no patient individual information. Okay, this is only the uh, three digit number X, okay. Y, Z. Okay, this so is we, can not, we cannot identify any patient from that the data. That's right, it's already anonymous. Okay. So you mean that there's no medical legal issues in terms of the, you know, the uh, privacy things like that. But it may be there's a kind of differences in the regulations or the in right, the right, right. Right, right, right. Um, processes to right. transmit some uh, medical data or even it's an anonymous, anonymous that they transmit the uh, medical data from point A to point B. It's right. still a no standardized um, right. system there. Yeah. So That's we right. need to go further regarding in this sector as well. That's right. So, so internationally, we should cut the patient into the data to the polygons to keep okay. the uh, data, yes. Thank you very much, Professor Sugimoto. So, Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, so I, I think uh, I'm a little bit uh, sorry to say that uh, I think Prof Professor Kim from Korea is uh, at this moment uh, quite busy. So I think he cannot join us uh, for this session. So we have a short, a bit shortened of our session, but we can uh, have more time for the discussion. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe I would ask uh, uh, Professor Balian to introduce our next speaker first. Okay, thank you, uh, Philip Chu. Uh, the next speaker I would like to invite uh, Professor S. Ao from Hong Kong. It's the colleague from uh, Professor Philip Chu, I think. Uh, he will talk about the advance and future of robotic surgery. Samuel Ao is a director of Multi Scale Medical Robot Center, Ino Haka, associate professor in Chinese University of Hong Kong a technology leader and medical product innovator in Fento with a deep knowledge in robotic and make, uh, make, uh, mechatronics system integration and product development extensive track record of uh, leading multidisciplinary projects uh, from concept to high value proof of concept prototype and transitoring from product development to manufacturing and process development. Experience in leading and preparing project for first human use and FDA 510 key submission, including design, verification, and validation. If they 
if MEA document control and process if MEA please the time is your professor uh, Samuel Au please thank you uh, let me share this can you guys hear me properly yes, yes. okay yes. let me share the screen so because I think I joined the I hope I this is the right way to join the network let me we can see your slide okay perfect so, so thank oh, you yes. for giving me a chance to uh, give a talk to all of you. So uh, my name is Sam. I'm an associate professor from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. At the same time, uh, I'm also the director, uh, partner with uh, uh, Professor Philip Chu uh, to lead the uh, multi-scale medical robotics center at Eno Hong Kong project. So today uh, I will talk about how, uh, how we can use uh, advanced uh, like uh, use medical robotic technology to advance a medical intervention. So uh, before I start to talk about uh, today's topic, so let me give you a very brief introduction on my background. So um, so, uh, so I'm sorry, I just hear some sort of conversation <laughs> of, of mine. But anyway, uh, so I did uh, like, uh, I did my PhD on uh, MIT, MIT, and after that, I went to Intuitive Surgical. In that company, uh, in uh, Intuitive Surgical, I helped to invent and develop two main products. One is uh, Da Vinci Single Site, and uh, I was leading the software and control, in particular, helped them to go through the FDA clearance. At the same time, uh, I think some of you may heard about uh, Da Vinci Iron Project, which is a project to allow people uh, to use a flexible robotic system to do lump biopsy. Uh, last year, Intuitive Surgical received the uh, FDA clearance on this project, and uh, I think they start to sell the robot uh, uh, by then, uh, in Q this year. And then uh, uh, four years ago, I went to uh, CHK uh, to become an associate professor there. And then uh, uh, some of the work I'm trying to present today will touch on uh, some part of this project and then also uh, some of my uh, recent work being done in, uh, at CHK. So uh, before I start the project, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, many of my collaborator, local collaborator, uh, such as uh, uh, Professor Neil, Professor Kaur, Professor Philip Chu, and Jason Chen, and other people from different departments and also the company. At the meantime, uh, uh, in, the, in the meantime, I also collaborate with, uh, uh, I also have a lot of overseas collaborators from um, Intuitive Surgical, uh, such as from Intuitive Surgical, as well as from Imperial College and John Sockin. So some of the work I'm pretending today is a collab collaborative effort uh, uh, contributed by those collaborators. So I think one of the uh, main research interests for me at this moment is to build a uh, uh, robotic technology to attack uh, some of the hard to attack region. Uh, like uh, in particular, uh, I'm personally very interested to build a flexible or combined robotic system so that we can uh, like uh, create new way of uh, uh, robotic system to interact with uh, tissue or uh, the uh, organs of, the, uh, of a patient. And uh, when we talk about uh, like uh, uh, soft or flexible robotic system, I think uh, pretty much uh, from the engineering perspective, uh, we normally deal with uh, fee, uh, fee element. One is uh, uh, really to build a uh, like a soft body or flexible body so that we can uh, like uh, uh, levigate inside the body without create a collateral, collateral damage. So it has to be flexible. And also in, in, in this part, we also talk about uh, building a flexible sensor because uh, when you have body without a sensor, it's a trouble because uh, you can only uh, be able to get there, but without knowing how much force you are applying or where you are at going through those torturous path, then uh, it's also an issue when you try to do surgery. The second thing is, uh, can you create a map so that you can guide uh, the robot to get there? The last but not least is, uh, can we build a, uh, like a, a reasonable uh, robotic control algorithm that can interact with the uh, soft tissue properly? And uh, these are the main, uh, like uh, these three are the main direction that uh, embedded in my research group. And then I, over the last few years, I spent all the time working to advance those technology one by one. So for example, this is one of the technology uh, 
I have been working with uh, intuitive surgical in the past is uh, a flexible sensor technology. Uh, this is a very thin fiber, it's like hair. Uh, with the fiber, you can measure the shape in real time. So imagine that fiber can embed it in the instrument, a flexible scope, endoscope. Then you can measure the shape of endoscope, even though you're going through your body without using the uh, like X-ray or using any other external imaging machine. And in the meantime, I also work with uh, my collaborator uh, from Hong Kong U, uh, Professor Gawai Kok, to work on uh, the ML ML based checking sensor using the ML uh, system. We uh, design our own uh, like a checking sequence. We can monitor the position of the system based on looking at the uh, coil location. So uh, these are the one one of the video we do a real time MRI guided uh, measurement. So in this. Uh, in this particular video, we actually have a special coil and special sequencing technique on the MI system so that we can real-time monitor the location of the flexible instrument uh, based on MRI uh, interaction with the coil embedded inside the hardware. So, and the accuracy is pretty high um, and also have a very high bandwidth. So this creates the so-called GPS or combined with the map, uh, which is necessary when we do a flexible robotic electrification. Uh, in terms of uh, hardware, uh, I spend a lot of time building different kind of flexible instrument, uh, where small instrument, some of the instrument size can get to uh, 3.5 millimeter, which is very important for some of the uh, like a pediatric surgery or when you go, when you do some uh, surgery around the ENT area, pretty much uh, you want to have something as small as possible. And then uh, part of the project become uh, the Da Vinci Iron system. And here's the, is the result about uh, how we can use the optical fiber putting in the instrument. The instrument here is a very early port. You can see we can really drive the robot to a very high speed. Uh, just a second, I need to turn off uh, noise. And then uh, we can actually also drive a flexible instrument at a very high speed. So that uh, you can imagine, you can have a tools with very high precision and high performance uh, to go through different parts of the body. And this is another uh, uh, early prototype I have uh, built when I was at Intuitive Surgical. So this is a flexible instrument with uh, optical fibers putting inside so that you can maintain the shape of the instrument, even though you are pushing force uh, applying on the instrument. The, the instrument by itself can maintain a certain pointing direction and angle. So, and then uh, later on, uh, they use that technology to build up the uh, Da Vinci iron system because when you use the festival robot to go to the lung, you need to, uh, you can change direction. And then if you pay attention to the pointing direction, no matter how you move the back end of the tip, the tip pointing direction remains the same. So because we have a fiber embedded inside so that you can stay inside to maintain the location and position of the, uh, like a festival instrument. And then uh, in the meantime, uh, I'm also interested to see, uh, as what I mentioned, as an engineer, we also want to uh, incorporate autonomous control or AI control to deal with a uh, flexible uh, like uh, um, tissue manipulation. Uh, this is one of the control we do is a soft robot. And then uh, we have a sensor inside, even though you push on the sensor, the sensor and the control algorithm can adapt so that you can follow a predefined path, even though you are predict developing the uh, robot all the time. You can imagine when you put a endoscope inside a robot because the tissue will push again the robot and then uh, uh, a lot of time you will find out your control may not be able to maintain a certain direction or pointing direction. But with this control algorithm, we can always maintain the pointing direction even though you're pushing again the skin or tissue. And then this is another example we do uh, by uh, using purely autonomous control, looking at the image, and then we can autonomously control uh, the so-called uh, the DVLK research kit so that we can manipulate a soft tissue at any location. And as what I mentioned, uh, some of the technology being applied in the Finch Iron system, which is a system putting inside uh, uh, the lung, uh, going through the mouth, and then inside the lung, they can do biopsy. And uh, with the previous, uh, like a uh, flexible technology, you can always have a very high precision and high stiffness, uh, like uh, to maintain a flexible instrument, even though you go through inside the body. And, uh, and other than uh, working on pure flexible instrument, uh, I also could invent uh, some other tools with other uh, uh, company like uh, uh, rechection.com to create a new type of a rechector, traditional rechector widget. Uh, but we are interested to build a combined rechecter. Let me show you a video. Traditional rechecter, normally they don't have a whisk or either they're widget. 
and then uh, or uh, like a uterine manipulator, they are really rich. So can we use a combined structure to build a rechapter that is soft and but at the same time you can apply force? Let's look at this one. So uh, so you can see uh, we can use the cable to open up the rechapter. The rechapter is a two pins of uh, like a, um, I don't know why they and then we can uh, in this case, we install our robot on the Da Vinci system and then we build the whole instrument by ourselves. And then uh, we can push again this uh, plastic organ. I know it's not very similar to a uh, like a phantom, but it's so the idea, basic idea about we can uh, lift up something uh, uh, using a combined system by teleoperation uh, uh, the device and the whole instrument will build in house. And then uh, this instrument is very powerful. We actually do a lot of tests on the payload and we, we can actually carry one kilogram payload for this instrument. I don't know why. And then, uh, and then recently we actually use a more advanced algorithm. We look at, we use a, uh, like a camera as a uh, checker and then uh, we can uh, look at the camera by pushing against the organ all the time without uh, any uh, like a human intervention. So we use a Da Vinci research kit and then uh, uh, create a robotic system and then uh, and then this is a very long tower. Uh, you can consider this is an uh, organ like uh, uh, some of the very soft organ in the body. And then uh, uh, we actually create some method. Uh, can really uh, automatically in this in this particular video. Uh, the next one, sorry. This one there was no human intervention. It's all purely based on camera image and the computer used AI technique to drive the whole uh, tower moving from one point to the other. And then it's all, all fully autonomous. And then uh, it's purely using the vision system. You can use endoscope or using some other camera. And then we try to set up different kinds of soft tissue, really soft tissue and see the robustness of the uh, algorithm. And then we actually, uh, done some crazy tests. Uh, I think there was a test. Uh, yes, here. So during the autonomous control, we actually can, uh, even though you apply some uh, mechanical disturbance, for example, if, the, uh, if you are manipulating the organ, if something move around, uh, the control, autonomous control can still be stable to push the uh, green point to the uh, circle to make sure we can get to the target position. Imagine one day uh, when you are doing surgery, uh, one of the hand is autonomous, the other hand is uh, doing tech operation driven by surgeon. So uh, you can have a, a autonomous helper to do organ rejection. Other than uh, doing the uh, new form of organ rejection, we are also working on a new type of uh, uh, like uh, orthopedics tools. Uh, that is different from what we have right now. And one of the things we found out is a uh, uh, traditional uh, orthopedics tool, they are all rigid. And uh, in particular, for example, if you are targeting for like, uh, uh, like spinal surgery, uh, if you have a rigid tool, you cannot get to the edge uh, tissue easily. But if you have articulate tools, then it will work. But uh, nowadays there are low uh, articulated drilling system or uh, like uh, uh, articulate deployment system. Uh, in the market. So our team is interested to build uh, like a, the, uh, the, a com a, to build a commercial available uh, tools for, for the market to have articulate drilling system. And uh, this is some of the research people have done, uh, try to use flexible robot to do it. But uh, uh, the force is not enough in terms of the holding force. So we build our own tools uh, uh, based on the Da Vinci research kit and then implement uh, a lot of testing algorithm to make sure they are strong enough. And this is one of the prototype. And then uh, this is one of the idea we have done. So we, uh, this instrument is about a uh, uh, 6.5 millimeter instrument. And then, uh, and then the surgeon was doing a teleoperation with our, uh, using the same, uh, like a DLK sort interface. You can sit down like a DaVinci robot, you can do teleoperation and they can do drilling. And then you can see we can articulate the jewel uh, to go through some uh, tight band. And this is another video. Yeah, you can bend around the jewel and then uh, using the standard Da Vinci interface. So, and then right now we are building another version which is around 4.5 millimeter size to tackle like a spiral surgery or ENT surgery. I think that's it uh, for my talk. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to ask me.
Yes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Samuel. This is nice. This is very big development. And uh, I would like to uh, ask you, in how many time do you think that the endoscopic uh, robotic can replace the laparoscopic procedure? Uh, how many times? I don't, I, that is, I think this is, my purpose is to build in the tools uh, to uh, improve the performance. So I think one of the uh, challenging endoscopic surgery right now is uh, uh, pretty much is, uh, can we deliver a tool that have enough dexterity, mm -hmm. similar to Da Vinci robot, but you know, the size for endoscope is kind of small. Like a uh, lot of time, the lumen you can uh, provide us to build the tools is about like, a, sometimes it's at most two millimeter or three millimeter. So mm. we may not be able, from a mechanical engineering perspective, we may not be able to deliver uh, uh, such small size of tools with that capacity as compared to the Finchy robot. So uh, I think uh, uh, it's like an apple and orange comparison. So uh, you, it is a trade-off. If you want to uh, minimize your size of incision, you have to sacrifice some performance. So I think at the end is uh, some surgeon like a more dexterity in their wrist so that they can do more complex surgery, uh, but they, they will sacrifice the incision uh, in terms of size of the incision or uh, like uh, uh, the collateral damage to the tissue. But the other people may, may believe uh, like uh, uh, if we can deliver, they may uh, still use endoscopic approach to do surgery, but the tools is not sufficient to do all the surgery. They may sacrifice some sort of precision and accuracy in terms of uh, endoscopic surgery. So I think at the end, uh, I don't think it's a complete replacement. It may oh. be coexisting. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. There's no other question from the audience, I think. Uh, perhaps uh, Philip Chu can give some comment. Philip, this is your uh, specialty, I think. <laughs> I, I think uh, the Samuel's uh, work is uh, very interesting because uh, he has uh, laid a uh, good uh, fundamental uh, engineering uh, discovery in terms of uh, the uh, development of uh, flexible robotics and uh, also the uh, improvement in the efficiency and the performance. So for example, like uh, the uh, retractor, so, and also the auto, so that allows him to have uh, auto, some kind of automation. So uh, my question to Samuel is that, uh, uh, if we are really, really going to automation, what do you think will be uh, the, the uh, perspective? How should we start? So because uh, I think uh, when we are, you know, now we have some kind of automation driving, but uh, we are not yet there, even though the technology is there. So there's a lot of hindrance. And uh, I have, uh, you know, automated parking uh, button for my uh, car, but uh, I seldom use it. I only use it like, uh, you know, in a whole year, just one time or two times, because just for fun, it's not for myself. I enjoy more uh, parking by myself. So how do you foresee uh, that the automation will be introduced to uh, robotic surgery? And right now I am the surgeon who is operating. I enjoy the procedure actually. So uh, Philip, thank you for your uh, question. I think those are very good. Uh, uh, you can say those are very good philosophical discussion and question. Uh, I think at one point, uh, uh, we all like to have more automation in surgery. I'm pretty sure this is one of the uh, ultimate goal that we are heading toward to. But in order to achieve that goal, uh, we can look at the uh, history of autonomous driving. People try to uh, like uh, launch one of some of the initial feature one by one before they get to the final autonomous system. So I, I would say uh, we can uh, follow their patterns uh, when they try to uh, deploy technology into surgery. Uh, for example, why we pick uh, a, like a, a autonomous, uh, like a retraction, because we think retraction by itself is a simple task and also a tedious task. Uh, if we can introduce some uh, automation there, then it will save uh, a lot of time from surgeon and also a lot of conscious effort from you guys. And then you guys can focus more on uh, like, uh, uh, the most important uh, task in the surgery. And some other uh, part, some of our group also working on autonomous suture using the Finchy robot. So I think those are another sub task we can think of if we want to speed up the procedure and then uh, 
at some point, I, I, I believe that you, uh, many of the good surgeons that like you guys can do everything by yourself. The question is uh, um, whether we want to automate some tasks and then give yourself more time to focus on something more important. That is the benefit we can provide from a, uh, autonomous, uh, like a, uh, bringing more autonomous technology into the surgery perspective. I think uh, this is uh, very interesting because uh, I was free speaker. Um, so saying actually that uh, we can have a handheld robot from uh, <laughs> Professor Salt, and then uh, we can have, uh, you know, like a 3D uh, reconstruction and uh, also a virtual reality reconstruction from Professor Suji Moto. So combining the robot and the imaging guidance, then uh, we may have the automation. But uh, I'd like to ask, uh, maybe it's uh, now can have a panel discussion. I'd like to ask, uh, both uh, Samuel and uh, Amir. So uh, for the um, handheld robotics, then it will be difficult to have some automation, right? No, so I if actually, it's handheld robot. <laughs> I actually disagree. First of all, I think uh, we have to remember that when we are uh, creating autonomous systems, we're not creating it to solve problems of today. By the time they will be on the market, the, the tasks that we will have to be doing are different. So I always say that why do we need to, to develop a complex machine to suture instead of us, instead of developing a machine that will make suturing obsolete? Because, you know, suturing is so crude and simple. We don't need to make a machine that sutures. We need to make something that prevents us from needing to suture. I don't know, glues, welding, laser, stands, all kinds of stuff that will make the result much better, faster, and cheaper without the task of suturing. So I think that we have to always think that we are not solving the today's problems. We need to think of the problems developing in different ways. So we need to find a system that will solve this problem. This is actually what we try to do here. Now, I think that a handheld system, if you think of it, can be transformed into something that's very, very sophisticated. You can stabilize it, you know, like a Segway in your hand. Uh, uh, you can create motions that are controlled or, or smooth. You can scale it down. It actually can become uh, more like a miniature exoskeleton for the surgeon uh, to perform in a way that is very, very similar to a large uh, robotic system. It just needs a lot more evolution and technology inserted into it, the, the problem of size is a problem, but it doesn't prevent, you know, we make drones and we can make, uh, we can make systems that are small and do the same as large systems. It's just a matter of uh, time. So I think that handheld solutions are, are still in, within the game of that. I also think that a lot of uh, uh, effort should be placed to the next step of uh, intervention, which is flexible, and catheter-based uh, systems on one hand and ablation on the other hand. So just reaching a target and ablating a tumor because I think these are the two most important fields in, in what we, that will replace a lot of the surgery that we, we do today. Uh, so that's, if I need to put my money in, I would put it in, in, in uh, uh, automating or targeting uh, needles or very small catheters or flexible endoscope and create making into making them into a real uh, working platform and not just a primitive uh, tool. Thank you. I think I think uh, Doctor So uh, have a very good point. I think uh, pretty much uh, uh, if we just focusing on uh, uh, doing autonomous suturing, um, maybe a little bit a uh, waste at some point. Uh, but if you look inside my talk, at the same time, uh, uh, a lot of time when we try to automate something, we also create our own tools. Because for example, like uh, when we try to build uh, like a rechecter, uh, we have our own special rechecter. Because uh, when it's kind of a package, if you want to create autonomous system, you cannot use traditional uh, system because a traditional system are targeting for manual approach. So they can be rigid because they assume you pay more attention to monitor uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, rejection. But uh, if you look at, look inside our design is, uh, is fully compliant. So, and then compliant with autonomous uh, like uh, uh, technology, then we can create a new solution uh, for our surgery. And then also, we also deal with some new tools like articulate uh, drilling system, which is uh, like uh, very important in the field. 
So as, as what I mentioned, like we also do a lot of flexible system. One of the uh, uh, work we in our team that we are doing is a, uh, like a autonomous driving and flexible endoscope. Uh, because at some point we found out uh, navigating the endoscope to get the optimal view when the surgeon is uh, doing suture is, is kind of time consuming. So those are the things I think we can combine together with imaging technology, uh, like a, a navigation system, as well as a flexible technology together to kind of, uh, I, I think at the end, the ultimate goal is to uh, improve the efficiency for surgery and efficacy. So um, I think that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. Okay. What do you think about the cost issue? This are for all panelists. Uh, the cost actually, if you're asking me, I think the cost sometimes is depending on the manufacturer. Uh, right now the technology is very cheap. Uh, if you think about you buy a drone, it's very cheap. Uh, because uh, mostly because uh, intuitive surgical is uh, a monopoly system. So maybe uh, the price is setting relatively high. But uh, if competition can go in, uh, the price can be cheaper. So okay. it's all about com competition. So uh, the question is, uh, can we create uh, some, can we have very strong uh, like a company to build, build product that can compete with uh, some of the existing uh, uh, product in the market, then the price definitely should go up because yeah. the semiconductor and software are cheap uh, from an engineering perspective. So I don't think cost is an issue to be honest. It's just competition is the key. Can we bring in a strong competitor to uh, provide, to offer alternative solution to the market is more important. It's not, it's not the, the motor is cheap, uh, computer is cheap right now, everything is cheap. Okay, very good. Okay, I think uh, uh, some uh, other, other comment or other question, please. Say it again. Uh, are there other questions or other things uh, we can discuss because we have time, five minutes? Uh, I don't have too much mm -hmm. questions. No, no. Professor yeah. Charles, have you any comments? Professor Charles? Because you are the big guy in this, in this area. <laughs> no, no more comments anymore. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. I give uh, back to Professor Philip Chu. Philip Chu, you can conclude all the things and I think we can close also the session. Philip Chu, yeah, yeah. are you there? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you everyone. I think I have to thank my co-chair, uh, uh, Professor Balian and also Professor Nagajima for your kind uh, uh, help in joining the session, the, the discussion. And also I'd like to thank our three renowned uh, speaker, Professor uh, Amr Sot, uh, Professor Maki Suchimoto, and also uh, Professor Samuel Au for a wonderful lecture. Uh, we have um, a shorter uh, time, so we can have uh, some rest. So thank you very much again uh, for joining this thank session. You. Thank you. Thank you. See you.